All right. So, namaste, both of you. Um, I saw your video of uh, chanting the 10 slokas. Outstanding, outstanding. I shared with a couple of my social groups, both on my Facebook as well as my social groups. <laughs> they are all stunned. In the, in the WhatsApp group, you know, I shared with my family, you know, my grandfather's family, which is about 30, 40 people spread out all over India. They all say, what? I mean, so amazed they are, with, uh, you know, you are chanting, you are sincerity, your dedication is really, really outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. We were very nervous. Thank you so much for saying this because we recorded at least five times, if not more, and my face was already, I could feel it. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was red or th three yeah. or four times. I don't even know how many times we tried, right? So I think it was three. Three? Okay, so three times. And then at the end, I said, oh, Mary, let's just do this last time because I didn't know what, what, what I was doing. I was deleting things, next up, everything with Zoom. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I was. Uh... That's, okay. That's okay. It came out very well. See, like like I said, no. Ultimately, people, serious people, are moved and touched by sincerity. That's what counts, right? Yeah. If you are so sincere. By the way, Mary, how is your family? How is your health and all the stuff? Me. Um, yeah. Hmm. Uh, one girl went. My daughter went to her new job in Hartsbrook, Connecticut. Yesterday, we drove her. She's better. Um, one of my son is still a little sick. He can't go to college yet because he needs three more days for that time period to, to pass. I'm much better, but I have a dry cough all the time. Okay. And we're, we're all better, I well, think. That's... My youngest son went back to school a couple of days uh, on Thursday, I think. Okay, okay. <clears throat> yeah. All right, good, good, good to hear. Yeah, we're all better. <laughs> So, so you see the background now, my virtual background. That place is called Sringeri. Okay, that's where um, the Shankaracharyas, so southern side, southern Shankaracharyas monastery is situated. This place was, uh, you know, as you know, very, very Shankara was in some 700 to 800 AD. That means at least, I don't know, maybe 1400 years old. Um, uh, from that from that time onwards, in this uh, it's called Matha in Sanskrit, so a monastery in English. Successive Sakracha gurus have taken position, unbroken chain, and they have tried to retain the the ancient method of teaching, etc. Very very orthodox, very strict. They teach Vedas, Upanishads, Vedanta, and so on and so forth. And uh, now, of course, it's quite modern. I mean, three years back, I went and in those days, in my younger days, they, the, to cross the river, there is a wooden bridge. There is no <laughs> concrete bridge. And during the monsoon seasons in August, June, June onwards, the water level will rise and they have to dismantle the wooden bridge. Otherwise, it will be blown away by the water. So if at all we have to cross, we have a very, very crude boat made of some very big trees, you know, leaves made of trees, and then we dry them and make stitch a boat on that, and we used to cross the ocean. Those days were fantastic, you know, those experiences when it's a torrential rain, you're sitting in the boat, which is very crude, and they cross the river. Because of the currents, the whole boat is circular in nature and shape. It is full. Even the boat, is, you can see the whole world spinning around you, you know, it's, it's all <laughs> risky. Dangerous in one way, but it's a phenomenal experience for us to go, get into the island portion of the river, across the ocean into the island. That's where this monastery is there. That is the place called Sringeri. And if you, if you ever go to the um, uh, India and, and get a chance to visit that place, it's in the hilly region. It's very, very nice. And uh, it will be a spectacular experience. Uh, my guru who taught me, which I mentioned last time, through his gestures and a few words, etc., used to live there before he passed away. So his successor is there right now. That's a great place. So let's just come back to um, Yoga Sutras. First of all, like I said, it's, both of you chanted so very well, so very well. Uh, so can compliments to you. Um, so did you get to think of those 10 Sutras? I have prepared a slide which kind of connects. Why the sequence of Sutras, right? 
why in the particular fashion one, two, three, four, ten, we, which we covered last time, we'll kind of revisit from four or five on was um, because I've created a workflow kind of a thing which connects how each sutra mentions some things, certain things which become building blocks for the subsequent ones. Let me try to share it and tell me, let me know whether you're able to see it. What is this? Sharing is always a problem. Wait, let us see. Okay, let's see. Oh, yes. Are you able to see? Yes. Yes. Okay, but I don't know for whatever reason it's not showing for me. So I will minimize this screen and go back to that. Yes. Are you able to see? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now clearly? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So you see this person who is sitting here uh, below. Yeah. He he was my guru, this person. Hmm. So he is right now in, in the photo he was taken when he was in deep samadhi. Um, so that's the guru who taught me a lot of stuff. Um, now, the question is, um, oh, oh, have you been able to go through the first 10 um, kind of contemplate, analyze, try to relate it to your respective experience. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Can you please uh, go and explain? You want me to explain my experience? Yes, please. Um, individual, each individual one. Well, um, the first one obviously is introducing the instruction of yoga, and then the second one. Yoga ha chitta vritti nirodha ha for me is is um, quietening that busy mind that's all those, all those thoughts in my head that <clears throat> all over the place. So quietening those that um, the activities of the mind, and then tada um, drashtu sarupe and. Avastanam, and then so there's something in me that is it that really sees that knows the truth, and so it is it can then be established in its true nature. So that means that for me, I mean, this is my understanding and my experience. I wouldn't understand something, I mean, if I hadn't had a taste of it. And then vritti sarupyamita ratra. Otherwise, if those, um, otherwise those, all those fluctuating thoughts in my head, those all that those mind mind things, would I I think that they're the real me. They're the ones that really know. I even said it. I think a lot a couple of times ago, and I thought that I I so I. I'm not what I think I am, and, and I kind of know that I'm not, but I still go with it, and then I get carried away, and then I regret what I've done. <laughs> and then, Vritaya Panchataya Ha Krishta Krishtaha, those five, there are five activities of the mind, Vritaya Panchataya Ha. Some, some are painful, and the others are not painful. Um, Brahmana Vibariya. Okay, the five um, activities or mental activities are um, pramana, correct understanding, incorrect or false comprehension, imagination, nidra, deep sleep, and smritaya, memory. Um, Pratyaksha Anumana Agamaha Pramanani. So the correct knowledge is based on a direct experience or perception. 
whether like directly experiencing something or perceiving um, a valid testimony, which like somebody has said it like a guru or it's, it's known, it's true or inference. You infer, I want, I infer that. And then the incorrect knowledge is <clears throat> is um, having confused understanding that's not based in, in reality, which is what pretty much what, what um, one has, I guess I can say for myself. Okay. Is that enough? Should I oh, stop? Very, very good. Very, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's fine. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to see because I would, I, of course, I asked Meral as well to share her thoughts because Shramana, Manana, Nididhyasana is the method. First, you hear about it. Either yourself or listen to somebody, read about it. In YouTube, nowadays YouTube, Internet, social media, several different ways you hear about it. That is called Shravana, means hearing. You may know it already, but still I'm explaining for the sake of uh, completeness. Manana is contemplating that. It's not enough if you listen. you got to find out what does he say? Why? Why not this way? Why not that way? So you, you must start thinking, deliberating about it. Right? Internalize. My, may make it within your mind and then in, and then deliberate about it. The Nidhyasana means you start evaluating. There is some degree of evaluation each person has to do, each inquirer has to do. Do I agree with this idea, with this notion, this statement? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Because if you really want the results which are promised by the very same text which you're reading, very strange, but that's how it works. It's extremely important for you to disagree with what it says, where you really disagree, instead of just blindly accepting. That's very important. Only then will the real purpose and the objectives and the end results assured in the text which you are reading or studying. I wouldn't say reading or studying, I would say you would certainly get, otherwise you don't get it. That's why I, I ask you, okay, you did 10, let's say four, five, you say, what is, what is your response? Now, I, 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 have, I have nothing to say, nor do I want to say anything about whether you are right or wrong. That's not the objective here. Mm -hmm. The objective is, are you doing this? Because even the right meaning you will not get just because I say so. You are assuming that I'm right. Okay, that's an assumption. Assuming that I am right, even then, my telling you will not assure that you will get that meaning. You will get that meaning only when you will get that meaning. Mm -hmm. That's why it's very important. Meral, you want to do the balance for? Then let me see how they are connected. I will try to use this slide which I prepared. Are you still able to see? I moved to a corner. I don't see you. You, you don't see me. You don't I just see. see. I see mental modification. There are five. I see that PYS Sutru one. Uh, but I don't see anybody. I don't see you or Morel. I don't see myself. Oh. Hmm. What about you, Morel? I'm here. <laughs> I can see everything. I don't uh, know what happened. I have. Uh, I have in the uh, upper right corner. I see you, a small little. You know. Yes, yes. Okay, well, well I see your chart. Okay. I just see Next your chart. Next to content review, your content view in the upper right corner. Maybe um, you can it, enlarge yeah. your your screen and then you can see it. No, mine is large as it can be. I've got direct perception, inference, scripture, testimony. I have that orange and then I have the black mental modification. Then I have the yellow practice and non-attachment. Attachment, repeated effort, and that's all my page shows. Just that. Okay. <laughs> what is that? Uh, oh, there just, we go. I just made it huh? smaller. I made it very small, and there you are. Oh, oh you got it. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. So you're able to see the slide. M M Meral, you're also able to see the slide, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So what is your um, 
you are uh, taught on the first four or five or the next four or five, whichever you want to pick up. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, Mr. Rao, I, I don't have, you know, I'm not very smart, but I tell you this, uh, I have no idea what is the true self because I didn't experience it yet. So all of this time, you know, like I feel that that lately, and this is not a judgment because everyone is uh, uh, learning different ways. But I feel that if I go on Facebook and go to different kind of, you know, YouTube and videos, everyone is talking about these big talks like self and consciousness and this and that. I don't really know what is that. I have very little experiences and I cannot quiet my mind. Mary is so much more advanced than I am because I, I cannot quiet my mind. But what I can do for myself is that I learn to, from inside, you know, kind of when I sing, I, I, from inside, I feel how my lip is moving. Or when I sit and I have these thoughts, I can kind of, I know my thoughts, what are the thoughts. And I agree with Sutra 1-7 that, um, that it's direct experience. That's how we can learn it. But in the other hand, and I also agree with that, that I have to listen either to the Sutra or to you, Mr. Rao, because you're an experienced teacher. But everything else I should just cut out. But when we start to analyze and uh, contemplate, I think, we're using also the intellectual mind, I think, and our goal is not to use that. Some other parts of our brain should be used because I don't know what is samadhi, but the, I, I think the ultimate goal of yoga is to, to get beyond body and mind, if I understood it correctly. But the more I think about things, the more I don't get behind my body and mind, the more I use my mind, the more my mind grows like a tree or like a flower. <laughs> And I'm sorry, <laughs> but this is, I think that there is a contradiction here that, you know, I have to think about these things, but in the other hand, I want to get rid of my thoughts or just accept, I don't know what to say. That's what I think that. Excellent, excellent. I, th I think whatever you said is very correct. In fact, that's the point, right? If, if you look at the, let me enlarge the slide. Can you, can you see the slide now? Yes. Okay. No, not so clearly now. It's it's a little bit blurry. The the is it? Oh, it, it was it better before? Yeah, it was it was better before? Yes. Uh, the the letters are a little bit. Yeah. Now I can see it better. Are you able to read? Yes. Now I able to read. Yes. Okay. Good. So uh, okay. So the point is, that's what Chitta Vritti is all about. If you if you remember. We defined Chitta in one of the earliest classes as how it's a combination of two or three elements put together. That is the territory, that is the playground on which all the thoughts rush. The nature of mind is such that it grows as you feel. Right? So that is why you 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 feel that just you right you rightly mentioned that uh, uh, what can I say because as I think as I keep thinking it grows bigger and bigger is what you mentioned right that's that is the nature of mind as you start thinking you're actually feeding the mind and if you start thinking about what you have been thinking so far you are adding one more thought. So likewise, it, that is why it keeps on growing. That is why Patanjali mentions yoga is a methodology, it's a technique, it's a tool which helps you to chitta vritti nirodha. Now nirodha, many places control, uh, they talk about controlling, translate as a controlling, but I would rather call it as sublimating because we all know very well, if you suppress if you use suppression as a method of controlling, it bounces back much more viciously. Anything, we know that very well. Therefore, the approach is more to sublimate. In other words, 
Um, uh, it's again a very beautiful word, but I don't know how far it is relevant. One might wonder the way I might I, I might say sublimation is it is like sidestepping the whole thing. We go, we drive on a highway, and we find there is somewhere everybody is slowing down. Cops car is flashing. Two or three cars are there flashing, and there is a small two or three car crash. You know. Now, if you get interested in it and move towards it, it's quite possible the cop may ask you to stop, and sometimes they even issue tickets for it, disturbing their work. On the other hand, if you sidestep and move aside to another lane and just move past, you just go away. That's what I would say as a sublimation process here. The only way to calm down the mind, make it smaller and smaller, contrary to what you said, the goal grows bigger and bigger, is to sidestep it. How do you sidestep it? Yes, please. Practice yoga every day. <laughs> Absolutely. Just practice the body, you know, first the yama niyamayas. So our mind, you know, you, we don't feel bad about ourselves and we don't have, uh, uh, you know, we don't think, you know, we like ourselves the way we are because we try to do help, be helpful to others and we keep, you know, like certain rules and regulation for, our, for ourselves. And then just practice yoga and not to worry about mind and emotions and this and that. I think that when the body is ready and when I'm ready, everything will happen on its own. And I don't have to worry about a thing. What do you think, Miss? What do you think, Mary and Mr. Oh, my new philosophy? Mm. Did you hear, Mr. Rao? No, I did. I thought you were asking Mary to respond to that. Yes. Oh, um, oh, that sounds ideal, but very difficult. I don't I mean, think. How, how many times have I promised myself that I will be disciplined and I will practice and I will um, not allow the mind to take me away? And then I fail. How many times have I failed? So many times. So I think I, I, I something, it almost feels like something has to be I, it has to be like a life and death situation or it has to be so powerfully strong. I have to have such a resolve to practice, to be committed. And um, and I think it, I have to, it's discipline. It's, it's a huge discipline and that I have to be committed to that. And I say that I am and I think that I am. I mean, every morning I get up at five and I do my yoga. It's no problem. I am doing that and I love it and I do it. But then I go and I make breakfast and then I, you know, I get caught up in life. Then I have to come back to my yoga mat and maybe sit meditation, maybe. But even that, I need the discipline for that. And so maybe I think what is required probably is a teacher or somebody I'm, to push. Yes, a teacher. No, right around. I, I, I think you are perfect just the way you are. No. And when you don't practice, <laughs> no, no. This is, no, no you don't, don't blame yourself. You're perfect. Why? I think you're perfect just the way you are. And your yoga practice is amazing. I, you're so beautiful, Mary, when you practice yoga. You're so open. I think you're perfect. You, you no, Mirel, but, but that, that's not how I feel. So it's, it's you know, I, I, I know because I'm in this body. That's very true. So what we will do is I think it's a very interesting conversation because this is what is getting reflected in the what I prepared in this slide. So since you people chant very well, and since you're able to read, you know, I have a difficulty in reading. So <laughs> can you one, one after another chant do this one, please? No, we cannot read uh, Sanskrit really well, Mr. Rao. That's a, uh, oh, yeah. Um, which one? Can you read? No, no, we cannot read it like that. Sorry. It's small, is it? What number is it? Number 2.4. Four. Four. 2.4? Two point four? The very first one. I think yeah, it's right. Vritti Sarupyam? No, 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 the first one. Vrittaya Panchataya. Krishna. Krishna. Yes. Okay, yeah. Vrita, Are you free? Vrittaya 
Panchatayaha Krishna Krishna. Yes. So this is what uh, they're talking about five mental modifications. Some people translate it as uh, painful and some not painful. Um, Krishna comes from a word klesha, which is what is called colored or stained. Painful is a secondary meaning, but primarily because some activities can stain your approach. Some activities even, for example, a good understanding is a process which does not stain your activity, your approach, because you need a good understanding to get somewhere. But even that is a mental modification. Therefore, even a good so-called good activity, unstained activity, can be a problem in a way. That's why I translate more as a stained and some are not stained. Then what are those five? The next one, Pramana. Can you read? Can you chant? Mirel, you want to? No, yeah. no. I forget it. Okay. Go ahead. Pramana. Viparyaya, Vikalpa, Nidra, Smritaya. Correct. So, what are those five reasons which cause all the mental turbulence? Like I mentioned last time, there can be hundreds if you count, or thousands but they can all be categorized in five larger groups. These are the five. Watch this. The right knowledge itself is a source of disturbance, mental disturbance. It is easy for us to understand the wrong knowledge could be a point of, shall we say, disturbance of the mind, but yoga tells us even the right knowledge can be a source of disturbance. Definitely wrong knowledge is. Delusion is, sleep is, memory is. Why? Because all these five elements, all the five categories trigger literally hundreds of thoughts. If you start with the statement that Chitta Vritti Nirodha is the objective, quietening the mind is the objective, any thought, good, bad, Laziness, imagine, or past which is haunting you, though you are sitting quiet, some memory comes and haunts you. Any of them can trouble your mind. So that is why in this sutra, they say a right knowledge, a wrong knowledge, delusion, sleep, and memory are the five different sources of this uh, mental disturbances. Then, then you go for the next one. Yeah. Ready, Mirel? Yeah. Pratyaksha Anumana Agamaha Pramana. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> the question is what exactly is this right knowledge? What is wrong knowledge? What is delusion? What is sleep? What is memory? That needs to be explained. Like I mentioned, I keep mentioning, there's always these kind of texts, Sastra texts, always build one piece of knowledge on the top of the previously explained piece of knowledge. In this, initially we said, there are five types of is why Vritti happens, mental modifications happen. Well, what are they? Then we list right knowledge, wrong knowledge, delusion, sleep, and memory. But now, Patanjali now takes the responsibility of explaining what each and every one of the five is. See in the five sutras. Direct perception, inference, Scriptural testimony are taken as a pramana. Right? Yeah. Look at it. Pramana is the, the first source of disturbance. What is a pramana? You can have a direct perception. You directly experience things. Like, for example, Meryl just explained that 
as she keeps thinking, the mind becomes bigger and bigger. That's a direct, direct experience. And on the other hand, inference means, like I mentioned last time, there is a soap smoke somewhere, therefore, potentially there is or there was a fire. That is inference. In our really conversation itself, you look at it, there are said, Mary, you're perfect. Your yoga is perfect. You look perfect. She was praising you so much. But what did you say? You said no. And the reason you said was because I don't feel it that way. That means you are, she is, that is, Meryl is using the inference. Okay. Anumana. Inference. She looks at you. She looks at your activities and so on and so forth. And therefore, she infers that you must be perfect. But what you're doing is you're using your own pratyaksha, your own direct experience. I'm not going to judge who is right, who is wrong. I'm just explaining the methodology. It's true. Your personal experience, you say, no, 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 I don't agree with you. I'm not perfect. Right? <laughs> See, <laughs> that's, per that's a perfect analogy. I mean, I mean, that, that, that's the reason I always encourage people to talk because if I give, explain things based on whatever you have experienced or whatever you say, you you can e understand much more easily than some strange example, outside example. Right. It's easy to understand through experience. Right? Exactly. Because ultimately, all intelligent beings and definitely human beings only act on what they are convinced about. Yeah. And that conviction comes from experience, some kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Then scriptural test, but still, you know, we say, again, what I will use what Mira said. Yeah, I see all that mind and all those things, but you know what? I don't know what this big, big talk is all about. Everybody is saying something. She mentioned that. That means, on the one hand, she's not able to accept all the things, all the concepts which are being told and explained by various people, including me, in all conversation. On the other hand, she... This is not what I meant, Mr. Rao. So <laughs> what okay. I meant is that the more I listen to this, the more I get away from something what we are really would like to have in yoga, you know, like this is some, you know, like, I don't know what is Samadhi, but you know, the what we what the the sutra teaches us that go behind the goal of yoga go behind body and mind and the more i listen to these things like you know like uh, true self and pure consciousness and all of this because i never experienced it and the more i listen to it the more i uh, i think about it i get away from it so for me you know i'm not saying that other people shouldn't because maybe it works for someone else but for me, it just doesn't work that way. I agree. Let, let, let's take your last statement. If, 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 if I have not uh, used your previous statement correctly, let me try to use your current statement. You read about Samadhi and you do know about it, but still you are willing to believe it. Why? Because of scriptural testimony. Because Patanjali says so. Therefore, you tend to believe it whether you have experience or not. Or you go and you learn from a few other gurus or masters of yoga who talk about samadhi. You have not experience, but you believe that person, right? That's what I mean meant by saying valid testimony or pramana, right? Direct experience, inferencing, or yeah, reliable authority, like a text telling is enough for you to accept or validate the concept, whether we have directly experienced or not. That's what I meant. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you so much. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. That's okay. That's how we have to go back and forth. And let's go to the next one. Viparya Yoga. Viparya Yeah. So, the second reason, second source of mental disturbance is wrong knowledge. What is the wrong knowledge? Now he defines it. Wrong knowledge means a one 
which is either outright false, completely untrue, right? It's like saying, if somebody came and told you, I saw a tree with roots in the sky and all the branches and leaves are on the ground, is absolutely untrue. Yeah. Therefore, that is one wrong knowledge. The second thing is, if it does not truly reflect the nature of the objects, for example, we know very well a reflection from a mirror has suffers later inversion. Left becomes right and right becomes left. So if somebody were to look at a reflection and start explaining the object, that person may get most of the things correct. Okay, he's, he's tall, she's tall, you know, she's wearing this dress, that, and so on and so forth. But some aspects of it, for example, the left and right may be completely changed. That means that knowledge does not truly reflect the object. Not only, it, it is not like completely wrong, but it is also not completely complete, not fully complete as it were. So that's what is called a wrong knowledge. This can also cause a lot of mental agitation. Why does it cause agitation? You start believing the trees have roots on the sky because somebody said so, and you start believing that, and you go around and you see everywhere, but you don't see it. All the trees seem to have the other way around. It can, it can cause tremendous upheaval in your mind. Why am I not seeing correctly? You may be the one seeing correctly, but because you are not... I'm in a class. Okay, sorry, sorry, I gotta mute myself. Any, you can hear us. Can I continue? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, and that's okay. We're so fine. That, so Any, that is, we're yeah, that causes mental, you know, agitation, etc. Therefore, right knowledge as well as wrong knowledge can cause tremendous disturbance in the mind. The next one, next one, please. Shabda gyan. Shabda gyan. Let's hear it, Mira. Shabda gyan anu bhati vastu shunyo vikalpaha. That is the explanation of illusion or the vikalpa. What exactly is the delusion? If the words do not correspond to reality, we, we, we always say that, right? The person is delusional. No idea what he or she is talking about. Fact is something, but the other person, the particular person, believes something completely different. Exactly the opposite. That is called vikalpa or delusion. The next one is, explains nidra or sleep. Abhava. Abhava. Go ahead. Yes. Nidra or sleep is a tamavritti. So what is a tamavritti? For example, there are our guna or shall we say um, it, it it's um Guna, how to translate correctly in English, would be attribute, for example. It is, mind is supposed to be drawn by three types of gunas. One is called sattva, or calming thoughts. We always know that if you're thinking about nice things which happened in your life, or if you think about a nice painting, or a good music, our mind is calm. That is a very positively enriching thoughts. That is called sattva. And the people who are calm, quiet, do not get agitated so easily. And even when they get agitated, their response will be, I shall we say, in my view, under proportional to the provocation. If you take an average person, how that person would react to a provocation, people who are driven by sattva guna respond much less. They get angry much less. The kind of words they usually much more softer words, so on and so forth. 
The Rajog Guna is exactly the opposite. Disproportionately higher response. For a small provocation, people may act very violently. They may hit you, throw you, abuse you, so on and so forth. That is called a Rajog Guna, a highly hyperactive to the point of being destructive. That is called a Rajog Guna. A tapo, Tamo Guna is a very lackadaisical attitude. You know, you do not give the value to the gravity of the situation or the importance for which the situation deserves because, you know, you are sleepy or lazy, you don't bother, so on and so forth. That is called a Tamo Guna. That Tamo Vritti is Nidra. Why? Because when you are sleeping, it is a cessation of activities. Whatever happens outside, you don't care because you are sleeping. And, and the mind is full of thoughts when you are sleeping. That's called the dream state. It is called a thought, way of thought about nothingness because in dream, nothing is real. Everything is imagined. Your thought is the one which takes the form of various objects. That is why it is called as a wave of thought about nothingness. That is sleep. Next, you will be the memory. Anubhuta. Ready, Maria? Well, no, no, just go ahead. I don't know this one really well. Anubhuta Vishaya. Asam Pramoshaha. Smriti. Right. What is Smriti is memory? What is Smriti? Memory. Memory. That is correct. Memory. memory. Memory is nothing but a recollection of some past event which is not really now happened. That is why it is called Anubhuta Vishaya Asam Pramosha. Something which happened, a vishaya is something, anubhuta, something which happened past, recollection of thoughts, that is called memory. This is how the five sources, that is pramana, viparyaya, vikalpa, vidra, pruti, are explained. So, if you look at it, first, it defined he mentioned there are five different sources of modifications. Then he listed them as right knowledge, wrong knowledge, illusion, sleep and memory. Then he took pain to explain very, very simple terms. What are those five? Each one of them he explained in this particular way. If this is the case, since the objective of yoga is Sublimating Chitta Vritti. How do I get that? Okay, thank you very much. You identify five four sources of disturbances. You name the five sources of disturbances. You also explain what each one of them are. Like Miral rightly said, all that is fine. People talk all nice concepts and all the subs. But what do I do with it? Since I'm not getting it, I might have to stay away from that, right? Which, that's a very right logical response. So what? You are defined. How do I get that? An ultimate analysis, knowing is not being. That means we may know in detail what is to be a president of the United States, but just because we know each and everything about being a president of the United States, we don't become the president of the United States unless we run for the post, get elected. Likewise, all this theory is fine. How do we get it? Then the answer comes. From one to I'm sorry? From one to twelve, right? Chapter one to twelve. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that's correct. One to So you mean Sotra. That's correct. Please, please read. Abhyasa. Mary, Abhyasa, Arya. Do you know this one? Okay, ready? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Vyasa Vairagya Vyam Tam Nirodha Yeah, exactly. How do I get all these things? How do I gain control? How do I sublimate? How do I quieten these five sources? Why? Abhyasa, which is practice, effort. Yes. What, what, what do you want to practice will come later. First he mentions Abhyasa, practice. Then Vairagya Abhyam, that means by dawn attachment. If you have a right practice and if you develop non-attachment, then you will sublimate. Tannirodaha, then you can sublimate. So he answers the method. What is practice then? Tatrastitao. Can you please? Uh, okay. I don't Ready? know. That we didn't repeat. We know from here. Yeah. Okay. I don't know Let's, this. Well, we'll do it together. Okay. Tatrastitao. Yatno Vyasaha. All right. Tatra Stitao Yatno Abhyasaha. That means repetitive practice. You try it, you get to some degree of perfection, but not enough. You keep trying and you keep trying and keep trying. Then you will get what is called as a practice. Then only it is called a practice. Doing routine, again, if I had to borrow, like you know, Mary was explaining, I start my yoga, then I go there, I have to take care of my household, I come back, right? That means she, she gets disturbed by that. But that's what it is going to be because that is the life you have taken. And what do we do? But your method of going, doing your other duties and coming back and continuing that is called repetitive effort to follow the discipline. Vithau yatna. Repetitively, without giving away, you try. That discipline is called the practice. Then what is non-attachment? The next sutra explains. Tatu. Ready, Morel? Oh, no. uh, I'm sorry. It, is, it, 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 it further, further explains the practice. Go oh, ahead. sorry. Yeah. Satu Dirga Kala Nairantarya Sakara Adara Adara Asevito Dridha Bhumi. Right. For example, this is what practice is. But then what is, how do, I, how do I make it stable? You can only make it stable by doing it for a long time without interruption. Like Mary was mentioning, he's getting interrupted. It's good that she has the discipline to come back and continue. But in many of these cases, the momentum carries you forward. Initially, you put in a lot of direct efforts. And after that, momentum carries you forward. It, it's like, you know, you're riding on a car in a highway. And suddenly, if you go to neutral, because the momentum cars continues to move forward without any specific energy from the engine, it's like that. That requires uninterrupted effort to build up momentum because every time you interrupt it, Momentum goes back to zero. You have to start all over again. So, not only you must do for a long time, Dirga Kalaha, Nair Antharya, without interruption also, you have to do it. But you must do it not with the feeling of, you know, oh my God, I got to do it somehow. Then I got to Determination. Anji, what is that? Determination. Yeah, you must have, yeah, earnestness. Earnestness. That's very important. That is the right word. Sakara, you must have the earnestness in the whole, whole approach. If we have that, that is 
if you practice for long, uninterruptedly, with all earnestness, that practice become solid like earth. Dhrida bhubi means like earth. It becomes very solid, rock solid as we call in English. This becomes, these three things, the yellow things is talking about the practice. Then the next dark blue we will talk about the non-attachment. Please go ahead. Drishtanu. Drishtanu Shravika. Vishaya Vitrishnasya. Vashikara Samya. Vairagyam. Vairagyam is non-attachment. What is Vairagyam? Vashikara means getting attracted. That is called Vashikara. Now, what are we getting attracted at? Normally, we get attracted at what we see or what we hear about. That is the primary source of our attraction. We see something, we like it, we get attracted. Or we hear about something, we or, or we hear, not only we hear about something, we hear something, we get attracted. Therefore, not, see, not seeking what you see or hear, that is called non-attachment. Right? Drishta means what you see. Huh? Anushika means what you hear. Therefore, what you hear or what you see does not attract you. That is called non-attachment. But you will still observe because your eyes are op open, your eyes work, your brain works, your mind works, your ear works. Therefore, all these sensors will collect the information. I will, it will project to your brain, but your mind will not go after that. That is called non-attachment. Tatparam. Can I ask a question before the next uh, lecture hour, please? please? Please, please go ahead, ask question. So how about, you know, like I feel very attached and very, I, I mean, not attached, but very, I like it. These three sutras, the number 12, 13, 14, because it's about the practice teaching me. So is this, is this also, I have to let that go, you know, just accept it, but not to like it? Oh, absolutely. The, anything. Anything. Anything, I would say, if you have a liking and if that leads to attachment is wrong. Remember, uh, in the very beginning, we mentioned, in five, we mentioned, right? Even a right knowledge is a problem. Think and of that. Mr. Rao, one more question, which I, I have like a conflict in my brain. Um, imagination, about imagination. Well, isn't yoga practice basically and a whole, our whole being based on imagination and we create our body and our whole life through kind of imagination that we be, you know we imagine this and we make it happen in our life because we talked about imagination like it's something not real or negative but isn't that everything is imagination in a in a regular person life uh, of course not when we want to go these very high level meditation practice which i have no idea about yet and maybe one day i will but not yet so isn't that everything is imagination? Mr. Rao, we can create our life with our thoughts. What do you think? Okay, let, let me unshare and then let's talk face to face on this. It's a very important question. We will answer that. I will unshare this so that uh, we can see. Yeah. Can you see me now? Yeah. Okay, it's a very important question. Imagination. Uh, I don't know in what sense you are you are talking about imagination, so you may have to explain that. But imagination is the way I, I understand where I would characterize is imagination means 
each one of us giving a particular value to everything else other than us based on our likes and dislikes that i would call as imagination i don't know whether you're using the same way or you're using imagination in a different way can you explain that so i i say that imagination like for example i you know i, I give something very simple like i think about a yoga pose right a new one I, I I I want to learn a new new yoga pose, <laughs> you know, like one of these in the book, right? And then um, I practice, but I am sitting and I'm not practicing. Let's say I'm sitting in the subway, and I start to imagine myself in that pose. And this imagination, I think, it can. If I start to really imagine and I can see that my arm is moving up and then, you know, like leg is. Eventually, as I practice, it will happen. Or uh, something like that. What do you think? Okay. Or when I practice, I imagine like, let's say, like I breathe in and I imagine that there is something on my hands. I bring it up and then I turn my hands and I push it down and then it goes down into my belly. Thinking of. <laughs> okay, here is the thing. The answer is even that imagining is a problem. And why is that, Mr. Rao? I'll explain why it's a problem. Imagination is, like I mentioned, the way I might define, giving a value based on our likes, dislikes, and belief system or other things is imagination. Now, in the method which you're talking about, in some cases, it may work out correct. Right? For example, in for some postures, you will be having some difficulty because when you raise your hand, there's a shoulder pain or something. But in a subway, as you're imagining, oh, man, if I did that particular way, it maybe it will work and you did, it became perfectly all right. I agree. But will it work in every case? Can you, for example, imagine that you're becoming, getting into samadhi straight away? For example, if in, in the yoga itself. I don't know. I wouldn't even imagine that, you know, like I wouldn't go there. <laughs> what if you did? That is the point. Today, today you are safe because imagination is not something you predetermine that you will do. It just happens. It is a it is a mental modification, it's a mental format, a thought format is called imagination. Today you're imagining about a simple exercise. There's no way you can say that you will not imagine something else. You can even imagine that you're growing a tail, for example. In, in childhood, we always imagine ours to be you know, warriors, princes, adventures, all that we imagine, but it need, did not make us. I wouldn't know that. <laughs> it never occurred to me, but maybe you're right. Yes. I, maybe I would, but I. We, we, most SS, please, Mary. Uh, point. I always imagine I will be in Samadhi. I always, I pray for it and hope for it. And I imagine it's a, it's a total imagination that, you know, oh, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and then I'm going to reach that. Or I'm going to practice so hard, and then I'm going to be, I'm going to live in the mountains, and that's it. I just imagine to sit in lotus for an hour. That's all I can do. Well, that's a, that also exactly. is exactly. that imagination. But it doesn't give you lotus. The point is this. I agree with you. I mean, your approach is correct. This is what is called bootstrapping in the IT world, software world. For example, if you take a computer, a computer runs on the basis of instructions. If there are no instructions given to it, computer will be, it's called, that's why in, in, in my younger days, we used to call it as a dumb terminal. It cannot do anything because it has no interest. It cannot show. It's called a dumb terminal. Later, they become intelligent terminals because it started executing instructions. A computer works on the basis of instructions. Very good. But when you switch on a computer, who gives the very first instruction that you must read other instructions? Because read an instruction and execute is also an extension. Right? You can yeah. put Word, you can put a Skype. They're all applications, which are a bunch of instructions. But who will tell the computer, go in a particular memory location, download the Skype, execute it, and display your face, 
display the PowerPoint, share the PowerPoint. Who does that? That means at the power on itself, it could require some degree of in, in instruction which will build itself. That is called the bootstrapping. Like for example, you take your boots, tie your laces, then you can lift your own leg. But if you don't tie the laces, you cannot lift. Therefore, these are all crude examples given to indicate certain minimum instructions are given hardwired in the computer, which tells the computer to say this instruction is not enough. Go to the larger memory or the disk, read more instruction and execute that. Uh -huh. Likewise, mind is a problem. It's full of thoughts because it follows things like like uh, with the sutras we read now. It hears nice things. It sees nice things and goes after it. It is getting attached. It becomes lazy. It gets angry, so on and so forth. But then this mind has to be quietened through practice and non-attachment is what Patanjali says. But then who will practice? The same mind has to practice. Who will have non-attachment? The same mind will have to have non-attachment. But that the mind is a problem. But we have no other means other than using the mind itself to cure the mind. That is called bootstrapping. Therefore, imagination is the source of all problems. Using the very same imagination, we start understanding that this is the way, this kind of imagination is the source of problem. Stay away from those imaginations. Redirect that ability to imagine in the right direction so that the number of imaginations will slowly come down. At one point in time, the entire imagination will stop. That's, that's what's going to be the next two things which probably will cover. Already we are just on a talk. We'll cover the next session. The next two so things we'll talk about. What is that stage? If we agree with Patanjali, who says that mental disturbance is the cause of all problems, and there are five different sources of mental disturbances, and, and through practice and non-attachment, we can gain control on the main mental attachment uh, or mental disturbance. If we accept using pramana, that is, Sabda Pramana, the sacred text as a Pramana, Patanjali statement as a validity, if we accept it, if I did all those things, what's going to happen next? First, we ask the questions, what exactly is the problem? The answer was, mental disturbance is the problem. Then we ask, what are the source of the disturbance? Patanjali gave, these are the five sources. What do I do with it? How do I gain control? By practice and by non-attachment, you can gain control. We are not going to stop there. We're going to ask him further. All right. If I gain control using practice and non-attachment, what will happen? How do I know that everything is quietened down? Then he's going to answer, which we'll see next time. Samadhi Anubhava will come. And there are two types of Samadhis. You could eat either of them during which the entire mental modification will quieten down. When everything quietened down, the so-called Purusha, which everybody talks about, is the ultimate and only reality. We get a sense of what that Purusha is. That's what we're going to discuss in the next class. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Rao. I'm so grateful. That and thank you, Mary, for being here with me. I'm so utterly grateful. I can't even put it into words. I'm, I'm really, really moved by this. Thank you so much. No, no. I mean, we have. I did, can we do this more often, Mr. Rao? What do you think? What, what do you, well, how often do you want to do? Once a week. Yeah, but like I said, the other Saturdays, I have the other session, right? We're not the session. Oh, okay. Mr. Rao, can you send for the for that for the link also? And same same thing, same Skype link. Okay. She Mary joined last time. Yeah, but I tried. You didn't send me that. I didn't get that link. That's why I couldn't join. I thought I sent in the email. No, no, I didn't get that. Okay, all right. The same mm -hmm. same thing. Anyway, save it. Save this link. It will work every time. We can use that. The reason why. 
I think it's a good idea to alternate between these two for you is that there are many concepts, underlying concepts, which are we discuss a lot in other sessions, which becomes helpful in understanding the sutras. Thank you. But if you still, if you want to accelerate for your other reasons, you want to accelerate this, maybe on a Saturday we can do this. Okay, well, let's think about it. Uh, I mean, we don't want to take up your time so, you know, so much, but uh, I talked to Mary about this. I teach on Saturday at 6.30 until 7.30. So either before or after, I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> what would you, Mary, you want to do every week? Um, once a week is good. Um, I mean, once I, I've two things for me. I have a big family. I mean, they're shrinking now, but um, also I don't sometimes when I get too enthusiastic and push something too much, there's a reason why I'm doing it and there's a reason why I, I will fail. Exactly. I, I think we should leave it at that because okay. let's go to even pace. As you notice, the initial concept framework I took a lot to explain without touching any sutras. Now, as you can see, now we are discussing sutra one after another. Every time we take five or six sutras. The most important thing is to understand the depth of it. Because I'm sure you've gone through so many other sessions where people have rapidly gone through, etc. This is not the first time yeah. this. Yeah. Well, I also want to, like, if, if you could suggest that we, you know, integrate it somehow in our lives or, you know, let it digest somehow over the two weeks so that we could maybe study it more. Maybe maybe Mirelle and I could get together and work together. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. And yeah, you can discuss with your students also. I mean, there are several ways you can yeah. use two weeks camp. I think right now we'll keep it like that. I use the same link for joining the other session as well. So that broader concepts of Vedanta is understood. And specifically, we'll keep it this this but this particular once in two weeks for a Patanjali Yoga Sutra. Right. Uh, if possible, you read through in advance so that you can chant because both of you chant very well. I want to hear that. <laughs> we don't know all the sutras. We, do Mr. we just had to learn certain sutras, not all of them. But Mary no, really knows all of them, but I don't. I will send you. No, video I don't know. Video. I'll send you YouTube link where people chant so that you mm -hmm. can practice if you want. Yeah, I, 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 I appreciate it too. Yeah. Sure, sure. I don't That's know. Really lovely. Okay, great. Because both of you chant very well. It's very pleasant to hear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, then. Namaste. 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 Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Bye, Mirelle.